Those Christmas Advent uh, videos, I hope you're enjoying them and being blessed by them as much as I am. If you haven't been getting them, you can either go to Fox River YouTube page and do that or download the app. You'll get those, a new one every day. I really hope it makes your Christmas season uh, a lot more special. So I wanna say to everybody, Merry Christmas. Here we go. It's good to be able to get that out and to get that going, isn't it? I think that we would all agree that when it comes to epic stories of history, the more of the actual story that you know and the facts that go with it, the richer the story and the more meaningful it is to us. Take, for example, a story of history like um, uh, the Apollo 13 uh, space mission. How many are familiar with the Apollo 13 space mission? Okay, got a few of you here. How many say that you know a lot about it? And yeah, right, you're kind of like, ah, I think I've heard about that. Apollo 13 was a routine mission to the moon that became anything other than that. And if you're not familiar with that, um, let's let this clip just kind of fill in some of the gaps for us. The controls, and I steer it around. FAO. We're going fly. For a nice, soft landing on the moon. Better than Neil Armstrong. Does it bother you that the public regards this flight as routine? It's nothing routine about flying to the moon. I can vouch for that. Launch control, this is Houston. We are go for launch. The clock is running. Houston, we have cleared the tower at 1313. Okay, guys. We're going to the moon. This is the crew of the Apollo 13, wishing everyone back on Earth uh, a pleasant evening. Uh, Houston, we have a problem. We got a wicked shimmy up here. Houston, we are venting something out into space. It's definitely a gas of some sort. It's like the heart rates are skyrocketing. The Apollo 13 spacecraft is apparently losing breathing oxygen. The emergency has ruled out any chance of a lunar landing. Why are so many people here? Something broke on your daddy's spaceship. I have a request from the news people. Take it up with my husband. He'll be home. On Friday. So I think I've lost the radio contact. Econ, what's your data telling you? It's, it's reading a quadruple failure. That can't happen. It's, it's got to be instrumentation. The ship's bleeding to death. This rate, we're going to skip right out of the atmosphere, and we're never going to get back. But we're looking at less than 15 minutes of life support in the Odyssey. We never lost an American in space. We're sure as hell not going to lose one on my watch. Odyssey, do you read me? How long does it take to power up the limb? Three hours by the checklist. We don't have that much. If you've heard the famous words by James Lovell, Houston, we have a problem. This is actually where they originated. And you've got three individuals who are 240,000 miles out in space, and literally the wheels are falling off of everything. Everything imaginable is breaking. Hope is almost gone. You've got three individuals that are gonna have to pack into a little lunar module that was made for two individuals and try to survive for four days on that which was only designed to be able to sustain life for two days. Oh, and the story just goes on and on that way. And the more of the details of the story of the individuals and what they were going through and thinking it literally becomes this, like, I'm moving to the edge of my seat. What was taking place 50 years ago on the ground crews here, it's almost unimaginable until you realize, but this is real life. So, if you haven't seen the movie and you're looking for something over Christmas, you could pull up Apollo 13 and watch it. In so many ways, here's the parallel with Christmas. If I were to ask you how many have heard of Christmas before, everybody would go like, ah, of course I've heard of Christmas. But how many really know the details of it? And that's when things can start to get a little bit fuzzy and the story just seems to get further and further away. But when we come like to the Gospel of Luke, he's going to give to us the classic Christmas story. You're gonna find out about the angel appearing to Mary, the birth of Jesus. We're gonna find out about the shepherds, the angels appearing in them, then going to the manger afterwards. And start the, the story starts to bring out the, the real life characters that are there. Now the Gospel of Matthew is gonna add to it. And Matthew is gonna talk about what was going on in Joseph's life. What was Joseph thinking during this? The magi or the, the kings that come afterwards and King Herod and his response. And then you come to the last Gospel which is the Gospel of John. And each Gospel of course is a unique biography of Jesus. 
And in the biography of Jesus, it seems like John just wants to jump right into the life of Jesus. But if you pause for just a second, you go like, John actually gives us more of the Christmas story, but he does it from this heavenly perspective and how it was being viewed. And that's what I'm going to take a little bit closer look at together. So if you happen to have a Bible with you, we're going to go to the Gospel of John. So you can open that up. If you've got a Bible on your phone, um, open that up. I think it's really going to help to follow along. A little bit um, more lengthy passages we'll look at here together. John 1.1 1, 1 starts out in this way. In the beginning was the Word. Now actually... I just love the way that John starts his gospel. And the original, his original three words, original language, reads this way. He says, before beginning began. You're like, wait, before beginning began? Yeah, before beginning began. In fact, say that with me. Ready? Before beginning began. It takes a little practice, I know. One more time. Before beginning began was the word. And what we're going to learn real quickly is the word is Jesus. So before beginning began, you have Jesus. And the word was with God and the word was God. And he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made and nothing's been made that hasn't been made. And in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. I want to put a little flag out here. Take special note every time you hear now the word light. Verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, so much John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself, John, was not the light, but he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And he was in the world, and through the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him, but he came into his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. And the word, that is Jesus, became flesh. And he made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one's ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God is in, and is in closest relationship with God has made him known. There's the Christmas story as it is from this heavenly perspective. But John wasn't done yet. In fact, if you turn over to chapter three, the Christmas story continues with what I hope are very familiar words. For God so loved the world that he gave, he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Now, we're to recap real quickly what it is that John said, we could probably do it in three points. The first point is this. John wants to make it very, very clear that light has come. Would you say it with me? Light has come. Now, that's the Christmas story. Light has come. Jesus is the light, and God sent him into the world. The second thing that John wants us to know is this, that light has come to bring life. The purpose of the light coming, and it was purposeful, was to bring life. Now, here's a great connection that's being made in the Gospel of John. John has a dual theme, and his theme is light and life. And for what we read here, like, oh, no surprise there, right? But here's what John knows, and, and he repeats this over and over again, because John talks about light 
23 different times in this biography of Jesus. And he talks about life that Jesus brings 44 different times. But John is probably the most simple, profound theologian that we're going to get exposure to. And here's what I mean by that. When John writes something, you read in his gospel and you just go like, that is simple. Like, that is super simple. I understand that. But then you pause for a second and go like, whoa, like, that is deep. I mean, that is so profound. Like what he does with light and life. Because John knew this, and he makes this theological connection for us. Every time God sends forth new light, it's always for the purpose of bringing forth new life or a new creative work. Light was the sign of life that was coming. In Genesis 1, God said, let there be light. And then he began this creative work that we call our worlds today. In John 1, we just read that, new light, the light of Jesus comes, and then the life is a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, the scripture tells us. But John isn't done, and in his final book, the one he pens called the book of Revelation. In chapter 21, the very end of it, he talks about the new heaven and the new earth being identified as this new light that is being shined again that way. He's super profound. But at the same time, John always keeps things simple because John had seen time and time again in thousands of people's lives the light of Jesus coming into their life and allowing them to see things that they had never seen before through this light of Jesus and the life that it gave them, how it changed their life. And so he said, light has come. Light has come to bring life. And then he, of course, wants us to know this, that darkness reacts to light. We read about light in the scripture, it's symbolic. Light's symbolic of God and his presence. It's symbolic of that which is good. It represents truth and wisdom. And of course, it's a symbol for life itself. Now, darkness, contrast it, it's the absence of God. It's evil. It's a place of both ignorance and deceit and also it represents death. And John's really clear in verse five. He said, the darkness tries to overcome. Katalambana is the word. It's really intense words. Like The darkness tries to overcome the light, but it just can't do it. In other words, there is a reaction that way. And quite honestly, this is where I think things get very personal for us. It's when God brings his light into our life. Because when the light of God comes into our life, we react. And we react in one of two ways. One of the ways we react to the light of God in our life is we try to get away from it, right? We move back to darkness. Crazy. Why would a person want to go into darkness rather than to be here in the place of the light of God. Well, one reason might be this. It's that light reveals. Light reveals the darkness that we have within us. And every one of us has darkness, struggles with darkness within us. Darkness, we struggle with sin. And here I am in the light of God, and it reveals the sin that I've got in me. Not the place I want to be, right? I mean, shame, embarrassment. I'm being like, you know, like opened up. And so rather than stay here in a place of exposure, I want to get like here. I feel safe again. Another reason, though, why I might want to choose the darkness over than the light. And quite honestly, it's because I prefer it. I prefer my sin over the righteousness of Jesus in my life. Does that surprise you? 
How about you? When I think I don't prefer a place of death, right? But I don't really don't see my darkness as death, life, death. It's just kind of like, no, I'm, I, I'm in a place that I feel like I'm in control. But in part, that's because sin's effect, and this is, it, it, it's universal. Sin's effect upon us is dece- deception and desensitization. Deception meaning this, Hey, if I'm over here in my sin, I think I'm okay, right? I'm not that bad. And in fact, I really kind of feel like I'm in control. And I'm good with God, though God seems very far away because that's the desensitizing effect. But the truth is this. I'm choosing this over this. What is God... Well, let's start with us. What do you think about a person that would choose darkness over light? At first, it's really easy to be judgmental, isn't it? You cho- you're choosing darkness over light? But before I get too judgmental, I just acknowledge this is me. Like for years and years and years, I chose darkness over than coming into the light. And so I recognize that and become a little less judgmental of other people. And then I realize how God responds to them. When God looks at a person, even though he has sent light into the world and they choose darkness, you know what God does? He continues his working in this individual's life. He sends his children to bring light and to show the love of God in their life right where they're at right now. Why? Because he wants to invite them to come into the light. This is the second response that we can have. I can choose to move away from the light or I can choose to move to the light. This is what you would call the place of repentance. It's the acknowledgement, God, there is this darkness in my life. You know that. I need you. I need what Jesus has done for me. And if you'll open yourself up to the light of God, it will reveal your darkness and it will also bring the life that Jesus came, the gospel, it will bring that to us. And if you haven't trusted him yet, this is the place of life and Jesus invites you to come into it. Now I wanna give us the bottom line for our series throughout the whole month and then the choices that that's going to bring to us this weekend as well. So here's our bottom line. Light has come. Would you say it with me again? Light has come. The message that God wants for us to understand this Christmas, especially, is the message that, say it again, light has come. God has sent his light. Jesus has come. That is a fact of history. But then it presents us with some choices. The choice that I have, first, is this. The choice to receive the light. Jesus' invitation to everyone is this. He makes the declaration. He said, I am the light of the world, John chapter eight. He said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus' desire for every one of us is that we would have the light of his life within us. Remember his words, John 1, 12? But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Jesus said, in the gospel, the reason that I've given myself on the cross, the reason that I've risen again is so that I can be your savior. And if you will come to the light and receive the light, that's exactly what Jesus will do. He will make us to be a child of God. That's our first choice. Now this choice actually then sets up the second choice. The second choice that we have is then to Walk in the light. These are John's words again. You see, as a Christian, I can choose to walk in the light. Think of it in this way. To live my life in the light of God. Or not. 
John is going to write another letter after the Gospel of John. He's going to write this, and it's going to be read by thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians. And to them, those that have received Jesus, John writes these words. So if you've received Jesus, take these words as words that John would be writing to you. But if we walk in the light, live. He is in the light. And we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And all God's people said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. I love these next two verses. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. And then he says, but if anyone does sin, it's like he's writing this to me. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. John says, I want you, as I've learned, to walk in the light of Jesus. How do we live our lives out that way? How do we live as a follower of Jesus? Well, we know, and we kind of build upon these four G's here regularly, We gather in Jesus' name. We continue growing in Jesus. We give in Jesus' name. We go in Jesus' name. And if you've never been to Next here, Next is the place we just kind of open this up but personalize it to wherever you're at with them right now, I'd encourage you to come. It'll be this weekend, but we do it every other weekend as well. And you can use a QR code just to find out when the next one is and to sign up for it if you don't have time for this weekend. But God continues this means of giving us light. This is kind of like just my own little, little bonus. I knew what I was going to be speaking on this weekend, right? Because I was prepared for it. So in my Bible reading yesterday, this is my personal Bible reading. I came to this, these verses. This is in John thir- uh, Romans 13. Listen to this. So we should stop doing the things that belong to the darkness and take up the weapons used for fighting in the light. Let us live in in the right way, like people who belong to the light. I'm just going like, this is a little spooky. And then I read, but clothe yourself in the Lord Jesus and forget about satisfying your sinful self. Now, how many of you think that Pastor Guy needs these verses? No, right? I mean, like, he doesn't satisfy his sinful self. I mean, right? I'm reading this yesterday just going like, wow, I feel like there's more light that God is bringing to me. Here's the the cool thing. When we open ourselves up to God's word, we talk about our Advent videos, talk about the verse of the day here regularly, talk about just finding your own Bible reading plan and doing that. When we do that, God gives us the light that we need to continue walking in it. When we're willing to take our next step with Jesus, whatever that is, he is then going to give us light for the next step as well. God wants us to walk in the light, but it's our choice because some of us choose not to. Third choice that we have because the light has come is we can choose to share it, to share the light. Or as we've talked about over the last several weeks here, we can be ones to help light the way. And I tell you, Christmas is a time that we have a great, great opportunity to be able to do that. It's such an activator. One of the ways that we can share the light we've talked about in my gift for Jesus Now, Max's story, I think, is so cool because we've been doing something for 15 years. And we've seen the fruit of having invested in a child's life who's now a young man in university. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to come back to that same place that he got the light and share it with others as well. It's not only affected him, it's affected his family, and it's affecting his entire community. My gift for Jesus gives us the opportunity to do that. Now, Maxon doesn't need our support anymore. He's in university. We take somebody like Benediction. We do cards up for all the kids that we can sponsor here. Benediction's in first grade. Maybe you got a first grader. Benediction, he could use somebody's support as a first grade child. As somebody who, if we do not feed him, he will be malnourished. If we do not provide education, he will not have the opportunity to be able to break out of the cycle of poverty he or his family. My gift for Jesus gives us an incredible opportunity to literally 
take the light of Jesus that we've been given and to be able to give it to another one. And we do that for $25 a month per child. Yeah, 300 bucks a year, and that's how we take care of that. For those of you who have been supporting kids through my gift for Jesus, you know what a difference it makes. You're changing a destiny. And if you haven't yet, this is new to you here at Fox River, I wanna invite you to join with us. Certainly, swing by the gym or the lobby or whatever um, campus that you're on and take a look. Maybe you're gonna find somebody your kid's age that's there or your grandkids. Or maybe you're gonna see somebody just like, you know, God just kind of like tugs at your heart and you go like, I could, I could sponsor somebody like that. But here's my challenge for us as a church. When it comes to Christmas, my gift for Jesus is a challenge. Would you be willing to give to Jesus on his birthday the same amount that you're giving to other people on his birthday? In other words, if you're gonna spend $500 on gifts for other people, are you willing to give $500 to Jesus? And you go like, how would I do that? My gift for Jesus, because it's gonna be giving Jesus what he wants. Feeding the hungry that can't feed themselves, bringing education, and literally bringing light into a person and into a family and a community's life. It's an exciting thing, and I hope you'll join with us in that as well. But more locally, we can share the light just with our Christmas services here. In our culture, we all know this, right? Christmas is going to be the most attended service of any service throughout the whole year. More Christians will come to church on Christmas than any other time of the year, and more people who aren't even Christians yet will come to church on Christmas just because it's Christmas and like it's culturally, it's the thing to do here. So what we wanna do, rather than just you know, craft a service that's really cool for us as followers of Jesus, we wanna to add to that a missional element. And so Fox River, if you haven't attended with us, we're gonna add a little bit more. It's not gonna be our normal service, so wouldn't expect a normal service gonna be a little bit more flash. It's gonna be a little bit more fun. We're gonna do some things that are just for kids because kids are gonna be with their families here and we wanna be able to make this time meaningful them for them as well. But here's what I'm gonna promise you. I promise you that we will always, 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 always share the gospel in one of the clearest ways that we possibly can. And we're gonna invite people to come to Jesus. And we have seen scores and scores and scores of people every Christmas, open themselves up to Jesus. And year after year after year, you hear about people that I, I received, I, I trusted Jesus at Christmas, and, and now they're here, and now they're growing, and you know, or throughout, scattered out through the country because of what's happened here. And we, we can have a part in that. One of the ways we can do it, grab a few of these cards on the way out. They're at all the doors. Use it as an invite. You can do this electronically too. You can scan the QR code there and you know, send out a digital invite. But I'm learning something over the years. Over the many, many years that I've um, pastored and been a Christian, I'm learning this, that almost 100% of the people that I don't invite at Christmas don't come. Yeah, I know. I was like, really? But so many of those that I do will. Never had anybody offended at me. Like, hey, would you like to come to a Christmas Eve service? Oh, I can't believe you'd invite me to Christmas. Like, never. Most people are like, yeah, I'm not, I, mean, I don't have anywhere else to go. I'll, I'll go. And whether it's your family, whether it's your coworkers, whether it's a neighbor, whoever, whoever it is, just give them a card, invite them, like, hey, would you come on out? And then I just encourage you, come one and serve one. Meaning, come to one service, and if you got a friend coming, say, I'll sit with you. If you got more than one friend coming to different services, like, I'll sit with you, I'll sit with you. Right? Just come to a couple services. But then serve one. Because we've heard, we're gonna, we got hundreds of different positions that we have opportunities to minister through. And I especially want to talk to you who would go like, I've never served at like anything like this before. But if you're going to be in town, you've never done it. Would you take the risk, scan that QR code, sign up, and just try it? Now, if you're not blessed by doing whatever it is that you do, you can come up to me, I give you permission, and say, I wasn't blessed, this sucked. All right, you, you can tell me that. And I won't say I told you so if you go the other route, like, oh, I kinda like this. I won't, I won't say I told you so to you. But I'm gonna tell you so. <laughs> 
It is something that we can do that is going to make a difference in people's lives. We're partnering with others that are here and they're bringing their friends and we're just, we're helping them to be welcome here, whatever that position is. And we'll work hard to find the right one for you. Why would we do that? Well, our heart is people. Our message is Jesus. Why would we do this? Because one who's received the light, one who wants to walk in the light, I just want to share the light. And we can in some of these simple and so powerful ways. So let's join in doing it together. As we move to our time of communion, most of us got these communions on the way in. Now we'll get you one in a minute. Before we do communion, I want to ask you, have you received the light in your life? Because if you haven't trusted Jesus yet, his invitation to you today is to come to the light. It will expose you. It will expose your sin. But to come and say, God, I need your forgiveness in my life. Jesus, I need what you did on the cross because of the darkness that's been in my life, darkness of my choosing. And through your death and resurrection, I know that there is forgiveness and that there is life. And I want that life, please. If that's your prayer today, then join with me in this one. Jesus, thank you that as light, you have come into the world to bring life. So many of us know what that means. But for those who are just stepping up to it now or stepping into it, as they pray this prayer, I am so sorry for my sin. God, I'm so embarrassed over this darkness within me. Please do your work of forgiving and of bringing new life to me. Please. If that's your prayer and trusting Jesus as your Savior, I'd like to ask you, would you just lift a hand high? And the acknowledgement is this, yeah. Today I'm trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior. Yeah, just up and down. Your saving work, Jesus, is amazing. And may each person that is acknowledging outwardly and those that are doing it inwardly but didn't have the courage to lift up a hand, may they experience the beginning of that new life right now and may it continue to grow in their life. May more and more light pour into them. Thank you for your saving grace and for saving them today. And all God's people said, amen. amen.